I'm going to do a quick little video on showing you how you can picture what's going on in a regression with more than one explanatory variable. And in this case, we're going to have two explanatory variables, and we're going to visualize the relationship in three dimensions. And I'm going to use a program called Maple because you can rotate things in three dimensions really easily. And I'm going to use some Maple code. And the credit goes to Yufang Hao. I know I'm mispronouncing that, but anyway, thank you. He has this uh, code we'll be using for Maple uh, posted on Maple's website. So let's suppose we have a model uh, where y is the dependent variable we're trying to explain with a y intercept, b0 a slope b1 times an explanatory variable and another slope times another explanatory variable. For example, in this case, let's think of y is the quantity of orange juice demanded, the quantity of orange juice we see people buy in a particular year. And we want to explain that with two prices. First, the price of vodka per gallon, which at least where I'm from is a complement to orange juice. A lot of people mix them together and also the price of orange juice itself. So before we get going, let's think, what do you expect the signs to be for these three things we're going to estimate? The y-intercept, the slope for orange juice, B2, and the slope of vodka, B1. Well, the y-intercept is going to tell us how much orange juice somebody might want to buy if those two explanatory variables were both zero. So if we put in zero for both uh, the prices, all we're going to be left with in this equation is the y-intercept. Do we expect it to be positive or negative? Well, we should expect that to be positive because if orange juice and vodka are both free, I think people are going to want a lot of orange juice. Now, the slope on vodka, if it's a complement with orange juice, if the price of vodka goes up, people will want less of the complement as well, less orange juice. So uh, we would expect that to be negative. And similarly, uh, due to the law of demand, if the price of orange juice goes up, we expect people to buy less orange juice, ceteris paribus, so negative. Now, let's actually look at some fictional data here in um, Maple. Now, let's first look at the data right here. I don't want you to try to figure out what all this code means. But one data point that we're going to look at, for example, is the price of vodka, $12, the price of orange juice, $5, and if the price of vodka is 12 and the price of orange juice is $5, then we observed a person buy 7 gallons of orange juice. So that's one data point, and it's going to be in three dimensions because we have three different variables that we want to plot at the same time. Now let's visualize this data here. Let me stretch this graph out a little bit so we can see it a little better. What we're looking at here is just two dimensions. We have x2, which is the price of orange juice, $2, $3, $4, $5, $6, and the quantity demanded. Actually, I have the y-axis upside down. Let me flip that real quickly. Oh, no, this is going horribly wrong. I should have had this adjusted correctly before I started. Let's see, okay. Here we go. Sorry, now I have the axes the right way around. So price of orange juice and quantity of orange juice is now going up uh, instead of down. So for example, on this point, the price of orange juice was four and we saw the person buy about six uh, gallons of orange juice. But we're just looking at one of the explanatory variables here, and we clearly do see that as the price of orange juice goes up, we see a negative relationship between price and quantity. Good. But let's also look at 
the other explanatory variable here. And to do that, I'm going to rotate this graph around until all we can see is the price of vodka, the X1 variable here, and the price of orange juice. Now, here we see something not so clear if we're just looking at this one variable. As the price of vodka goes up, we actually see what looks like a quantity of orange juice going up to begin with, but then there are a few points here where it looks like it's going down. So we couldn't really identify a relationship if we just looked at these two variables, quantity of orange juice and price of vodka. I'd say there's no relationship there, no clear relationship that we can tell. But this is a problem. You can't just look at variables one at a time. You have to look at the whole relationship. So what we do is instead of fitting a straight line through the points, we fit a plane through the points. So let's go down here and look at what we do when we run a regression and we have two slopes. Now, look at this plane. It's a surface. You can kind of look at it from this angle and it kind of looks like a line. You can look at it from this angle and it kind of looks like a, a line, right? But it's really a plane. Now, how does this work? What we need to do is identify, for example, this point. X1, the X1 variable, is about $12.50 for the vodka. The X2 variable here on the left is about $3. So for the price of orange juice is $3, the price of vodka is about $12.50. Let's turn this up. And let's see what quantity of orange juice we would predict. Well, it's kind of hard to pinpoint, but it looks like maybe around 11 units on the y-axis. And so this tells us that we have to take into account both of these variables at once. Now, I find that a lot of students have trouble visualizing what's going on when you're doing this. But again, all we're doing is identifying. Here we're just looking straight on at, we're looking at an X1 value, a price of orange juice, and a price of vodka, and then we're looking where on that plane does it tell us that the quantity of orange juice will be. And we look over here at the y-axis, and it tells us. Now I know that's kind of difficult, so let's go back to uh, what is the equation of this plane? And that's a little simpler to work with, but for people like me who are visual thinkers, being able to look at a, at a plane like this actually helps. But some people just don't like it. So let's go back to what is the equation of that plane? Well, this is the equation we were looking at, and this is the equation of a plane. It tells us a unique value of quantity of orange juice given a y-intercept and uh, two slopes. Now, sorry, let's, let's go back to that graph just for a second because we can identify one thing really easily. What's the y-intercept going to be? Where the price of orange juice is free and the price of vodka is free. Let's turn this up and see where does that plane touch that y-axis right there when they're both equal to zero. Well, we can see that where that plane touches the y-axis is at about $18.50 or so. So I hope we can see that. We can also kind of tell that there's a negative slope. When the price of vodka goes up, there's a negative slope of that plane. Um, people will want less. And if we look at it from this angle, we can see that as the price of orange juice goes up, there's also a negative slope in that direction to that plane, just as we predicted. Okay, we won't look at that anymore. What exactly is the equation of that plane we had? Well, the y-intercept turns out to be about 1857, so uh, that would be about 18.57 gallons of orange juice if we plug in zero dollars for those two prices. But let's suppose uh, that the price of vodka was $13 and the price of orange juice was $3, then 
what quantity of orange juice would we predict? Well, we just plug in $13 into the price of vodka right there, and we plug in $3 for the price of orange juice in this equation, and the slope for the price of vodka is negative, as we expected, and it's negative 0.53. And what that tells us is, for each additional dollar vodka costs, we'd predict a decrease in about 0.53 gallons in the quantity of orange juice. The slope on our price of orange juice is also negative, and it's negative 1.1. We interpret that as ceteris paribus. For each additional dollar orange juice costs, the quantity of orange juice people will buy, we predict, would go down by about 1.1 gallon per year. So again, plugging in a particular number, let's just suppose we went into a store and we saw in this region of the country vodka is $13 and orange juice is $3. What would we predict on average for people in that city? Plugging in the 13 and the 3 gives us 18.57 minus. This part of the equation gives us negative 0.689. This part gives us minus 3.3. 8.38 gallons of orange juice is what we would predict. Now, of course, this is just an average expectation or prediction. For any given city, we're going to be wrong. There's going to be either a little bit higher or a little bit lower, and that's where that E comes in, this error term, that tells us that actual observations are either going to be a little higher or a little lower than what this equation of a plane in this case predicts. Now going back one last time to this graph, let's look for these error terms. Now if you look at this plane, do you notice how none of the points are actually sitting right in the plane? They're either a little bit higher or a little bit lower than that plane. If we view it from this angle see that some of these points are sitting above the plane, three of them above, and it looks like two of them are below the plane. So these errors are the distance between the actual data, actual observations, and what the plane would predict people would consume. So I hope that this has enlightened some of you, at least some of the people who are visual thinkers, visual understanders of, of what's going on. And so try this on your own. If you want to and you have a, a copy of Maple, go get that code from uh, the Maple site and uh, see if you can plot your own data and see what goes on.